This podcast is for informational purposes only. It is not intended to provide medical advice. It exists only to entertain. At Bennett Medical College in Chicago in 1907, a young aspiring medical student is discussing his dreams of becoming a famous pioneering surgeon with one of his faculty advisors, seeking his blessing to embark on a new field of cutting-edge research. Hello, Professor. Thank you for seeing me after class. I had something I wanted to discuss with you. Well, I'd like to think there's an open-door policy here. I'm always available to inspire the next generation of doctors to push the limits of their education. You said you have a revolutionary idea you wanted to talk about? Uh, Yes, Professor. I've had an idea that I can't shake, and I think it'll revolutionize medicine as we know it. Oh, well, that's quite the revelation. Let's hear it out, then. Well, sir, I have it in my mind that there may be a new frontier in surgery. Well, that certainly sounds exciting. I think so. You see, with all the advancements in surgery at this time... You mean like anesthesia and not using our dinner cutlery to open an abdomen? Well, yes, more more or less. Go on. Well, so I think that doctors should use their surgical skills to improve the human body, as it were. Um, not sure I follow. Yes, yes, I'm still learning as a medical student, but it seems to me that we should be able to make things better with certain refinements in surgery. Hmm, you're being a a bit vague here, son. Yeah, what I'm saying is that when someone has an organ that doesn't work, maybe we could, you know, fix it. Hmm, hmm. What do you mean by fix it? Uh, Maybe replace is a better word. Like, take the kidney, for instance. Sometimes kidneys stop working, right? Uh, Yeah, I suppose so. So what if we were to take an organ like that out if it's not working? Or better yet, put in a new one that is working. Son, are, are you suggesting we could just take an organ out of a person and then just put it into another person? I mean, organs are complicated structures. I don't, I don't think you can just take a kidney out of one person and put it into another. I mean, what of the ethical concerns? I can only imagine. What? <laughs> no, no. Using people's organs would be barbaric. I wasn't suggesting that. Well, then, then what were you suggesting exactly? Goat testicles, sir. <laughs> what? I think that if we take goat testicles out of a goat and put them into a person... It would certainly improve their vigor and their overall health. Uh, What? Sir, will you sponsor my research into the matter? Um, Goat balls research. Goat testicles, yes. You want to take goat balls from perfectly normal goats and put them into people? Yeah, I very much do, yes. And you want me to sponsor your research into this? Yeah, that that honestly would be great. Son, I'm a professor at an unaccredited medical school in the early 20th century, and even I think this idea is stupid. Man, I knew nobody would understand. I I don't mean to be dismissive. It's just I don't think you've thought this through. I mean, why not sheep testicles or better yet, bull testicles? Why goats? Well, sir, as far as animals go, I happen to believe that they're the greatest of all time. Oh, no. So you're leaning towards yes, right? Oh, son, you're bad at reading people. But this is my dream, sir. Yeah, you have bad dreams, too. (laughs) Goat balls, the future (laughs) of medicine. Uh, Nope, nope, absolutely not. (laughs) Just saying it is so stupid. Welcome, everyone. This is Poor Historians, a podcast delving into the archives of medical history. As three emergency physicians, we will explore the unusual ailments, treatments, physicians, and all related medical material having to do with the healing arts. I'm Max, and I'm joined here by my good friends and colleagues, Aaron and Mike. Gentlemen, are you ready to talk about goat balls this post-Christmas week? <laughs> I'm ready. I'm excited. <laughs> who? Wait, who wrote this episode again? Uh, it wasn't me. 
<laughs> if, if only the listener could see how pleased Mike looks right now. Oh, he's, he's so he's so happy, beaming, he's, yeah, just excited. I mean, this this is tradition, though. I mean, this is post Christmas or one week out. Uh-huh. This is when you talk about goat balls. You yeah, always he's give like me. A goat that found a trough full of garbage it's, it's... <laughs> which one was the last one it's been a while right i think it was the farting one or the the king enemas the, king, the kings and colonics yeah, which yeah no, was, yeah that honestly was a great episode you, you were working a lot we had, to, we had to dust you off you yeah know? i so, remember yeah, no, yeah. i'll give you plenty of work don't worry buddy i was at a soccer oh. game i was researching it on my phone i was like this is gonna be great <laughs> <laughs> well speaking of which for a shout out this is you know, what happens when you do send a suggestion about a quote doctor, you know, quote unquote doctor that uh, you would like us to do a show about. And so if you send us an idea, it captures Mike's imagination. And here we are. And that being said, I want to give a nice shout out and a thank you to Lori, who wrote to us with the idea for today's show, gave us the idea for the subject. And Mike seized upon it and i don't know what's about to happen but i'm kind of excited about it and so we dedicate whatever does happen to you Lori. you're very welcome mm-hmm. thank you, you Lori. grab the goat balls by the roots and here we go. <laughs> it wouldn't just be by the balls <laughs> so we are actually balls talking about balls. <laughs> <laughs> so we are actually talking about goat balls today mike Is that what's happening we are yeah and oh. it's like oh, merry christmas by the way i didn't tell you beforehand oh thank you merry christmas to you as well or happy christmas as they say in other countries New Year coming up, goat balls. Yeah, new, yeah. I don't. Know. It's it's gonna be something. Hopefully, there's a lot of what better way to bring in the new year? Immature chuckling. That. Not on the show. Yeah. All right. You ready? Every time you every time you say balls. Every time I say doctor, you've got to do the air quotes if you're listening. No, okay. doctor. <laughs> John Romulus slash Richard Brinkley. Dr. Brinkley. Yeah, we'll figure out in a little bit like, why it's a, a quote around the doctor. Hmm. So we've we've covered a lot of characters on this podcast related to unusual therapies, questionable practices. Um, some of these were born out of the lack of knowledge, and some were loosely based on science, but some were clearly designed just to take advantage of people's hope for an improvement in their ailments and potentially you know, make lots of money. Um, and it's really challenging to distinguish like those who knowingly promote these unprovable unproven medical therapies and those who are mistaken as to their effectiveness. See, I shouldn't have written this as an outline form. I should have just been like goat balls, a lot of space, (laughs) and then like (laughs) immature laughter, Finn. You know, I was going to say, he's starting just, off really straight and narrow well, here. No, yeah, because it's like, like, it's like a perfect I see the podcast ones, start. Yeah, I know. I see the ones Aaron does. They're so put together. Yeah, but everybody Mike, expects that from me. I need you to, need you to do I'm this the, from your heart. Yeah. That's all I need. Yeah, I know. Just but speak I mean, from this, the heart. So this part of it was like actually kind of near and dear because we we deal with a lot of this stuff yeah. modern day. You know, it's so frustrating like, too, There's right? quackery. So just wanted yeah. to start off with like some definitions of what and and why people like Dr. Gopal's quote Dr. Gwope balls are important in medical history. So um, that's a great point. I think it's different when people are meaning like they are f- from a good place promoting something that might not be helpful. Like they're still trying to be helpful versus people that are just trying to t- literally take your money. Like Galen. That is a big difference. Galen was wrong, but Galen believed. Yeah. And there was nothing to suggest that he should have known otherwise. But yeah, if Galen knew best. and he's pushing this and like yeah. he's charging people tons of money to get bloodlet, like... Then he's yeah. The jerk. I actually I suspect Galen was in the pocket of Big Leech, <laughs> <laughs> or Big Sawdust. <laughs> yeah, get all that sawdust to get all that blood, or Big Bucket. <laughs> I think your point is accurate, though. It yeah. is. It, I think there is value, even though we know that. Or I, I mean, we don't yet because the episode's not done. But we, I suspect Doctor Goat Balls is not on the level. Um, well, hey, we have to find out. We, never we have know. to find out. But I, but I, I do think there is a place for discussing uh, historic medical quackery because it does inform how medicine has changed. It does inform. There are reasons that people seek out and or people profit off. Well, and these it's still out there today, causes, right? Mm-hmm. So it's still out there today. It's important Gwyneth. to talk about. It's hope. It is. Speaking of hope, uh, Dr. Goatballs. Okay, yeah. So looking back, if there's no clear-cut <laughs> evidence of fraud. just wanted to see those two words next to each yeah, other. We, we got to make assumptions as to the minds of the practitioner. So that's our job after the fact, like figuring out was this person, you know, knowingly deceiving people or not. Um, and like our job at the Poor Historians podcast is to delve deep into the 
annals of history and attempt to answer these questions. Mm -hmm. In medical history is full of heroes, villains, lucky bastards, poor souls, and uninformed idiots. In the worst characters in medical history, my opinion, are the charlatans, and then followed by the quacks. And this is the kind of what I wanted to define, because we've kind of referred to some people as quacks. And a quack and a charlatan are two like very different things. And you've heard the term charlatan before, but mm -hmm. it's kind of like one of those things where you know what it is. You don't really know the definition. It's like mm. This is a case where I'm sitting here going, I think I know the definition, but now I don't know that I know yeah, it. Yeah, it's a little so bit I'm, tough. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm excited. Yeah. And like the term quack has a very significant historical or <laughs> a very significant historical sig significance in history. <laughs> <laughs> the definition. So like, so we it's have good, modern good day quacks. And modern day quacks, they overprescribe pain meds and sedatives. They tell us in infomercials to wear magnetic bracelets to cure arthritis. They push our crazy medical theory on talk shows or their crazy medical theory on talk shows and try to get us to believe that we'd be much more productive if we just took our focus factor on a daily basis. You know, we've all been exposed to quackery. And as a society, I would hope to think that we're less likely to fall for these tricks, but I don't think we are. Yeah, I don't think we are, yeah. So the, the difference between a quack and a charlatan is really the credentials. Like quackery is a false representation of a substance device or therapeutic system as being benefic beneficial in treating a medical condition. So like mm. the snake oil remedies, um, you know, improper diagnosis, maintaining a state of health, the deliberate misrepresentation of the ability of a substance or device to prevent or treat disease. So quacks typically okay. will have a medical license, they'll have training, they'll have credentials that, that make them more dangerous. So um, like the, Dr. Oz, I'll Dr. just go Oz. ahead and yeah. like a legitimate cardiothoracic surgeon who actually mm -hmm. practiced and somehow still says you should drink your own urine. Right. But, the, but again, like the, the idea is that essentially just trying to use these ideas to separate people from their money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they're yep. using, and they're using their title. They're using, and, and whether that title is legitimately obtained or not too is, is, you know, can be a question, but mm -hmm. yeah, using your, your station as as a medical expert, at mm -hmm. least on paper, uh, so that using that, pushing false claims, especially making money, you're saying that puts you more of the quack category. You're a quack. So, yep. With, you as opposed to charlatan, mm -hmm. which... So you, yeah, and then quack is actually a shortened historical term. So it used to be called a quack salver. So it's from Dutch. <laughs> Qu huh. It's K-W-A-K-Z-A-L-V-E-R. No so it's a hawk or awesome. salve. So it's no. essentially like people wow. would go and sell you this ointment and like you're a quack salver. Like you, this ointment is going to cure all these things. And people knew that it wasn't going to do anything after the fact, but that's, you already had left town. Um, so it just got shortened to quack. Decent band name. Mm -hmm. well, in the, Nothing in the, to do with ducks. Nothing. No, well, no, in the Middle Ages, the term quack meant shouting. So it's like shouting. Okay. Ducks do shout. Yeah, they, they <laughs> sold their the wares on the market. They would shout, like, hey, you know, put this cream. Oh. on this spot in your body and then you'll feel great huh. so Fair yeah enough. so cool. yeah i, I guess the difference the easy way to, to kind of describe this is that quackery is a fake cure from a real practitioner mm -hmm. and then the charlatan mm -hmm. is a f or for real practitioner or charlatan is a fake practitioner i okay. So okay a charlatan will make fraudulent claims to their medical knowledge you know treating the sick without knowledge of medicine or the authority to practice medicine we see these players in history and currently today too so that sets the scene, you know, hopefully, again, the, the quackeries, the, the quackery charlatans. Um, and it sets the scene for Dr. Goatballs. <laughs> Dr. Goatballs, Dr. <laughs> Brinkley. So he's more the quackery uh, he is because a, he's no. carrying a type. No, he's, he's a charlatan? He's a, oh, we technical. don't know. Okay, okay. Never mind. I'll back off. Yeah, There'll be a quiz off. at the end, listeners. There'll be a quiz. <laughs> so, yeah, again, thank you to Lori for this idea. Like, I n I've never heard of this. You know, which I think is really cool. Yes. So hopefully this will be, you know, new to most everybody that listens. So in, in her email, Lori had said that his Wikipedia page is a WTF through history and delightfully insane. And she is not <laughs> wrong. You read this and you're like, what in the hell? Like the story is made up. But this person, it's like, this is the kind of person that does this. You know, like we'll get into a lot of the medical stuff, but some of the extra medical stuff later on. But it would just be really brief. But in the first line, it says John Romulus Brinkley was an American quack. But really, should have said John Romulus Brinkley was charlatan. an American charlatan. Yeah, come um, on, Wikipedia. You yeah. can submit corrections, Mike. No, I know. Yeah, 
that's a good thing. <laughs> I don't know that I have like the interest to do that, but, but maybe, maybe I should. Yeah. Um, so the doctor and quote, John Romulus Brinkley was born on July 8th, 1885 in North Carolina. His father was a physician and he served as a medic um, for the Confederacy. Some of this like backstory is it's like interesting and it's not, it just shows you how messed up the guy was. <laughs> So it puts us in the right time frame. Now, like late, yep, late, late yep. 19th century. So yep. when I when I read this, I'm going to be confusing myself. So I don't think anyone is going to really be able to understand what I'm saying as far as his <laughs> like relationship things. So just <laughs> like we're, we're fast here for the whole it. the whole ride. It's fine. We're yeah. Good. So he was married four times, and at the age mm. of 42, he married Sarah Mingus. <laughs> just like it even sounds like a dumb name. Anyway. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Poor Sarah. They <laughs> called her, uh, yeah, no, I guess Mingus, not Lingus. Um, but so so they're married, and um, Sarah's 24-year-old niece moves in with them shortly thereafter. Her name was Sarah, too. But okay. they called Sarah Mingus, the wife, Sally, so he could differentiate between the two Sarahs. Sure. Well, this was also a time that there was only like four different names you could use. Yeah, right? you're right. It was all, yeah. yeah. There's Sarah, there was William... I think there was John. And what was the fourth name? Skyler. Yeah, they're right. <laughs> <laughs> Madison. Madison. <laughs> With three Ys. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, sorry to all the Madisons out there. Yeah. Apologize. Oh, nobody with three Ys is listening. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Sarah, not Sally. And I've already forgotten who is Sally. <laughs> <laughs> no, Which Sally's one the is wife. it? Sally's it's a terrible the wife. system. Sally, okay, Sally's the wife. No, no. Then Sarah, so Sarah, the, not the Sally. Yeah, Sarah, not Sally is the niece. Okay. okay. So That's Sarah, right. not Sally. Sarah, not Sally gave birth to John Romulus Brinkley out of wedlock. Uh-huh. Oh, wait, no. Oh. oh, no, no, no. We're going back to the father. Got it, right? So this is the his dad. Yeah. So, so yeah. he was a bastard to be John. With. Yeah. Yeah. So he, yeah. And then, so... Brick goat balls, his mom died of TB <laughs> when he was five and subsequently raised by Aunt Auntie Sally, who was Sarah. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> anyway. So his dad was the one who was married to Sally. Yeah. And his the dad's niece moves in. John Brinkley mm-hmm. is a result of his dad and his niece. Yes. Good start. Good start to life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Starting right. off well. So then his father, John, died when he was 10. Um, when he Brinkley was left with. Sal, Sarah. Auntie Sally, Sarah. Auntie Sally. Yeah. So Brinkley went to school in a one-room log cabin, which was held for three months out of the year. So he, you're not going to get a great education that way. <laughs> <laughs> Graduated at 16, and he got a job as a mailman, but desperately wanted to become a doctor. Probably like some, you know, childhood trauma. Like wanted to be like Dad, but maybe because his be father better. was. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. So he ultimately found his way out um, to on the east coast worked with the railroad heard that aunt sally was unwell so he returned home and then sally ultimately died the hmm. years where it gets really stupid so john was comforted <laughs> by sally <laughs> sally wilkie it's, it's another sally wait <laughs> wait, wait hold on wait say it again so, what? so he goes home because auntie sally dies and then or is sick Who's and really dies. sarah and then okay. Yeah, so John comes home, and then he gets a lady friend by the name of Sally Wilkie, who, <laughs> and they're both named John, right? It's John and John, whatever. John, John Romulus is John Brinkley. Was there only four names? <laughs> well, it's Richard. He he later changed his name to Richard because he thought Romulus sounded a little bit too flashy. <laughs> well, it's, it Romulus is flashy. At least I'll give it's it a flashy that. name. Yeah. yeah, founder of Rome. Yeah, right. So, um. So he ultimately, he marries new Sally. So like, this is already, they're off to a bad start. So they posed as Quaker doctors. So both of them pr- pretended to be doctors and they, they're pushing um, medicine in Tennessee and ultimately settled in Chicago. But mm-hmm. I, apparently while they were down there, and I might get into this later, like they rented a space, they did all this stuff. They never paid any bills, never paid rent, made a bunch of money, just left town and the place was empty. I mean, it's a, it's a good repeatable business plan. Yeah, yeah, I mean, as long as you're okay moving. Money. So he, you have a harder um, time doing it now, I would think. But yeah, um, people would find you. But so back he, then. yeah. So he ultimately, um, so he enrolled at he enrolled enrolled at a, a medical college called the Bennett Medical College. It, at the time, Damn, was, I haven't heard of it. Yeah, so it was <laughs> even back then you probably didn't. It was unaccredited, and mm-hmm. it was focused on eclectic medicine. 
Um, and that was kind of this thing. <laughs> yeah. Classic. So it was like, Please tell me what that is. I don't think I've heard that. So like towards the end of the, the 19th century. So this is like the 1840s, a bunch of these schools popped up and I think it was for people that wanted to go to medical school, but you know, potentially didn't have the grades to get in or didn't know. Um, but it was an anti-medical movement. Mm. So it's like, it, it's a branch of American medicine. So it kind of, it, it's almost kind of similar to the DO thing. Like DO is medicine, right? Plus mm. the manipulations. This is like not medicine. Mm, so fair. they use botanical remedies, other substances, like physical therapy practices and all that. So it was essentially like, we don't believe that any of the medicines that you believe in work. Got and it. Unaccredited. Just so like, yeah, you can call yourself Collect everything doctor. else. Yeah. Collect right. everything else. Mm-hmm. And yeah, no, like again, it was, it was panned by, by medicine. Sure. It's like these places are dangerous. Yeah. You shouldn't operate them. It's competitor too. So yeah, right. yeah, that's true. Mm-hmm. Well, this yeah. is like it's, here's a real deep cut, but it's this is what year does he go? Is it the? This is like 1907, right? I think I. It's like the very early, and I, there's something, and maybe it'll be a future episode. But there's something called the Flexner Report because in the U.S. there was a ton of unaccredited sketchball quote medical schools uh anybody could really open one and so i i is it was definitely between 1910 and 1920 off the top of my head that the the flexner report this basically this this guy flexner came in and they went through all these medical schools in the u.s and they were trying to standardize like okay like the people who come out of this school seem to know what they're doing the people who come out of this school not so much and they went through and they had to standardize medical teaching so that you didn't have these quack diploma mills and so the the schools that survived and are still in existence today they were because the flexner report vetted them and this included a lot of do and osteopathic schools because they did have rigorous anatomy and you know eventually pharmacology and those sort of things but like some of these other schools as i suspect this bennett college is uh didn't have those things so like not disparaging use of herbal medicine if you know well studied or physical therapy but these were people who they weren't doing it. They were doing it either a as a way to lash out against the regular medical establishment, or they were just doing completely untested stuff with no proven benefit and selling it as medicine. Yeah, they either believed in it and they they wanted to train people in their thought process, or they wanted money and then they knew that these people would be willing to give it. Hmm. So, um, and Brinkley wanted the money. Well, I mean, later on, but maybe he learned from these guys, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. So, uh, Could be. yeah. The, the, well, it sounds the, like he was already posing as a Quaker doctor with right. his Right, uh, he was Sally. already very questionable with his, so. um, yeah, practices. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the, the first class of these eclectic medicine schools graduated in 1833, and the last school closed in 1933. Mm-hmm. Um, so they had a pretty decent run as far as, like, medical history in the U.S. goes, and yeah. Um, but again, it was shut down in part because of guys like this. So he was in school, um, finished his first year. He was introduced to the study of glandular extracts and their effects on the human system. And like, again, it's, there's this gap because he never really explains himself as to why, you know, he's just like, Hmm, weird. The the next step is goat balls, you know? (laughs) (laughs) And we're talking uh, reproductive glands in this case. Uh, Yeah. Goat goat balls being goat testicles. It's a gland. Oh, yes, you're right. It's it's, it's an help. So he never made it out of, like, didactic study. He made it through two two years of school. And then... um, Maybe he was really advanced. He didn't need all the extra school, Mike. But he also, like, he was kind of he was an orphan you know like he didn't have a lot of support so he had to work while he was in school um he was trying to support his family um so he was working at the western union union it says working two jobs they don't say what the other job was uh, while going to school uh and he came home from work one day to find his wife and his daughter were gone Mm -hmm. Um, Uh new sally filed for divorce um and was looking to get child support from brinkley and he just didn't pay he's like whatever um so then it's an option, I guess. Like they somehow reconciled. His wife dismissed her suit, uh, returned to Chicago where, where Bennett Medical College was uh, with the child, um, and then left him again in his third year of school. <laughs> it was like very Wait, rocky. just left the child? No, left the, 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 the Sally and the child left again. Oh, they reconciled. So rocky, yeah. So rocky, he was like, you know, I can't rocky finish marriage. school. Yeah, I've He's got like, way too I much. I need to meet a new Sally. I can't do this with old Sally. <laughs> yeah. I'll I'll settle for a Sarah. <laughs> like, just give me something. Um, so he yeah he left the school his third year didn't pay his tuition. Mm. Um, so he started working in North Carolina as an undergraduate physician, but he just couldn't establish a practice down there. 
I think I think people were kind of like, well, I'm going to go see a doctor. I'm not necessarily going to see an undergraduate doc. And I don't know what that means. I don't know if it just it's like an intern or whatever. Uh, Somebody uh, well, who hasn't finished school, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, you could still yeah, hang I mean, a shingle. Step one is at least finish the quote medical school. Yeah. Yeah. So he was like moving around different towns in Florida, North Carolina, really couldn't establish his footing. So then he wanted to finish school. He couldn't go back to Bennett. So he was trying to apply to a new medical school, but they, they wouldn't forward his transcripts because he owed them for three years of school. <laughs> so Fair. finally, he's like, you know what? Screw it. I'm just going to buy a diploma from a diploma mill. So he, <laughs> so he goes out. Option. Yeah. So he buys a diploma from Kansas City Eclectic Medical University. There now he is a physician of eclectic medicine. <laughs> oh, After man. that, they moved to New York City, and yeah. So he, apparently, Sally just was done, so she left. I don't blame After her. After all of this, yeah. uh, he opened up a shop called the Greenville Electromedics Doctors. Is it in North Carolina, Green, Greenville? Uh, no, I, um, I, you know, I actually don't know. No. I, I kind of presumed it was in New York, but it might not have been. Oh yeah, you might be right. Um, anyway. So he put a bunch of print ads out to attract men who were concerned about um, sexual issues primarily. Mm. So he always people that are willing to spend money. Yep. Yeah, right. That's a good. That's a. Hey, that's a. If you're going to be a quack doctor, that's a great target. Oh yeah. So yep. here's some quackery for you. So they injected mm. different colored water into their patients at twenty five dollars a shot, which would be about seven hundred. That's so much. Yeah. Back in then. Oh my god. Into their veins or in under their skin. And it, it was that would that would hurt. Yeah. So yeah, they're like, well, this is electric medicine from Germany. You've never heard about it. <laughs> well, where do you live under a rock? Oh my god, you're so dumb. <laughs> Give me the money. Uh, and then again, closed up shop, left without paying rent, utilities, debts. And I'm sure that there was probably you know a mounting legal challenge against this stuff. Like, what the no, heck is this guy doing? No, no it seems pretty airtight. I just to colored me. colored water, electric yeah. water from Germany. I think what happened was that he was being found out by other practitioners in the area, and then. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. um so All back right. in the day again, Sally had left. They didn't officially divorce, but then he got married again. Um I'd have to look up what his second <laughs> was wife's like, Please tell me it's Sally. Name is. <laughs> no. But he still was married to Sally, so it's still a Sally you, in his life. I'll look it up while you keep going. <laughs> so this Greenville Electromedics doctors, he ultimately like takes over that medical practice, makes enough money where he could pay Bennett the tuition that he owed. I, mean, I don't know how that debt follows you back then. You know, how are you going to find somebody? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I don't know. Another LinkedIn page. Mm -hmm. But by this time, eclectic medical schools had really kind of developed their bad reputation. It was really felt that they weren't a part of the mainstream medical education. But again, he, he got what he wanted from that diploma mill. Um, and then he was called up for service during World War I, uh, but he only served two months. He said he was <laughs> sick. He had a nervous breakdown, so he couldn't be deployed. It sounds oh, like... Yeah. That might that uh, that could have been true. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure he would have. I'm sure all of the or a lot of the young men did. Yeah, usually after, right? <clears throat> yeah, usually shell shock. You get a oh my well, god! But you ever watch yeah. those videos? They're really kind of distressing. Oh, oh they're yeah, terrible. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, World War One is awful. Yeah, it's absolutely yeah. awful. But in 1818, he opened up his own 16 room clinic. Now here's where it gets interesting. I think he understood like how to get in tight with these communities. He made himself like uh, very. I guess popular. This is this is in Kansas now, so okay. he paid um, really good wages to staff, and then during the sorry, that's not eighteen eighteen, nineteen eighteen. Yeah. Okay. During the flu pandemic, he was like extremely helpful. He successfully nursed flu victims back to health. People had a positive view of his care in these patients, and yeah, so like he endears he actually, himself to the community. He and... did. Yeah, he paid the staff well. He did a really good job during this trying time. So then he was kind of like, all right, you get a pass for being. A dink. Yeah, but, it, you know, the state of the art for flu care at the time was warm blankets. Yeah. So, I Essentially, mean, yeah, yeah, he let go people... Wrong. It doesn't say that he charged... He probably charged them... Oh, I'm sure he did. ...to do yeah. that. But the the idea... So all of that's fine. Like, it sounds like he's not necessarily a great person, does a good thing. Um, but then the reason why he's on our podcast is thanks to Lori again. But then because he wanted to fix men's sexual weakness. <laughs> yeah, so the idea he had was to to transplant a pair of glands from an animal. And we've talked about these types of transplants, the kind of like xenomorphic transplants. Yeah, definitely we have, yeah. <laughs> but he thought, you know, putting a pair of goat balls in you might potentially help. <laughs> 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 so 
That it, right there is a tagline for the episode. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Dr. Brinkley, he thought that putting gold balls in you might help. <laughs> well, so the story that is told, and apparently like this is, I think this is the way that he described it. So his first victim slash patient um, paid Brinkley $150 to allow him to do the operation. So he, uh, now the operation itself, I, I could not find any like detailed description of what it was where it was like probably some accounts, didn't make a new england journal uh, no. at the time <laughs> well and he wouldn't let people watch because he's like i can't let you learn how to do this because you're going to do it wrong i'm the only one who could do it right mm. so and Classic. there aren't any accounts so like we don't know if these were sutured to the outside some say that it was like you had the the nuts sutured to the outside of your body some they, they were put in your sack <laughs> just Anyway, if, if but, two are good, four are better. You just right. shove them in there. I saw something <laughs> where, like, did, he did this for women too, correct? Oh, yeah. He would put for fertility issue. There's, I'll go into it a little bit later, but hmm. um, yeah, you'd have to put them near the, the organ. So you'd have to put them near well, the ovaries. That makes sense. Yeah. Sense, yeah. <laughs> but I don't know. It could have been on the outside of the body, it could have been on the inside. I couldn't really tell. Maybe a listener knows more. Did people die? Because. <laughs> Oh, yeah. 19. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I was yeah. like, oh, okay. All right. So, yeah, his initial <laughs> recount of the request to have this procedure done, the initial procedure, totally doesn't sound made up at all. <laughs> so, Brinkley just happened to be having a conversation with an impotent farmer. <laughs> As you do. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, <laughs> he... <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. I want to know, did, are you going to get into, how did that conversation start? Like, you know, just... Farmer no, they're just like against a fence. Chat, he yeah. walks up to talk about like how lovely cows yeah. you have. We well, see this fence you post. Know. If that was me, I'd be falling over. <laughs> 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 um, so yeah, so Brinkley tells the guy they're talking about his impotence and whatever. And so Brinkley says, "You wouldn't have any trouble if you had a pair of those buck glands in you." And there's a goat behind him. Hmm. And in response, the farmer absolutely never said, "Well, why don't you put them in? Why don't you go ahead and put in a pair of goat glands in me? Transplant them." Grant them all. That's the way I'd graft a pound sweet on an apple stray. Like this that literally is, is in quotes. Not what this happened. guy said this that. It was written no. after that. So, you know, Brinkley no. is kind of like, well, I wasn't going to do it, but this farmer was like, please do it. I'm willing to give you $150 to do this. From like, that moment right. on, I decided to be Dr. Goat Balls. That's not yeah. what happened. So yeah. after he fully transforms to Dr. Goat Balls, he suggested that having goat glands surgically implanted in, on, or around your nutsack was a cure for 27 il- ailments um, <laughs> from dementia to emphysema, flatulence, <laughs> sexual dysfunction. <laughs> flatulence? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Uh, <sighs> as a general rule, I will say for any listener who probably knows this uh, more or less intuitively, but the more things that a treatment claims to cure, the more unlikely it is it does anything. Right. True. So this guy, I mean, he was a businessman, I think, above all else, at heart, maybe a corrupt businessman. But he, so he started this direct mail blitz. All these, he's trying to get patients in so they'll take the goat nuts and get them <laughs> pushed inside of it. And he, he's got a contemporary too. This, he's not the only one. There's another guy named uh, Sergei Vanderoff. Um, so he was transplanting monkey testicles into men for similar reasons. So it's like goat testicles, Ooh. monkey testicles. So maybe Sergei needs his own. My nice monkey testicles on. are superior to goat testicles in every way. If we do nothing else way. for the world, we will bring them every animal testicle transplanting position we can yeah. come across. Do, do, not, get accept get the whole story. <laughs> yeah. do not accept second best. Do not accept the pale imitation never. of monkey testicles that <laughs> goat testicles represent. Goat testicles get the best. If you were going to tell them, if I was going to come up with something, like I, I would say, like, like let's use monkey testicles. At least they look like people. Yeah, right? and like you'd goats. think that there's more genetic material that's common, so you're less likely to have potentially a bad reaction. Yeah, no, I mean, but, I don't know if in like 1920 or no, whatever they wouldn't have known is. that. Yeah, but yeah, but no, but, I, I I take your point. You you would just generally think like that seems to make more sense. But it could have been that yeah, like they're castrating goats. Maybe I don't know if they castrate goat. I don't know what they do on farms. Like I've <laughs> never really watched the goat walk close enough to see if there's still nuts on them. <laughs> so uh, you know what they do? They actually take them off and they put them on pickup trucks now. Oh yeah, so that's uh, that's where mm-hmm. those come from. So yeah. Not a lot of people know that goat balls. Yeah. Uh, they call them Brinkley balls. Yeah. <laughs> so um, whatever. He sends out this direct mail blitz. And then um, the American Medical Association is kind of like, all right, there's <laughs> there's something amiss in Kansas. <laughs> We've got to keep an eye on this guy. Because I'm sure it was very commonplace at that time for people to be kind of peddling their 
their obnoxious wares and trying to like get people to buy into this stuff. Oh, I mean, it's it's like legendary. Although we're we're kind of talking about like I always have that image of the you know snake oil salesman coming to town in the old west or whatnot, setting up his shop, hawking his wares, and then moving out. Like you said, this is later in that, but it's kind of the same setup. He's coming to town. He's putting forward this mail blitz like kind of advertising campaign. He endears himself to the community. He convinces all these people to let him do transplants of goat balls basically <laughs> and uh you know it is it's it's the same it's the same um smoke and mirrors kind of mm-hmm. dog and pony show as you were as yeah it were. but he's trying to bring legitimacy too because he know he he can't move this mortar brick and mortar store like he can't he he should have known that he should fly under the radar but i think what happened is that he just got um way greedy, too overconfident probably. and greedy yeah so the sergey vanderoff is in chicago he's He's going to be doing um, a surgery for, as a demonstration to show like other people, like, here, this is how you do it. This is the reason why we do it. He's going to give away the secrets. Yeah. So then, uh, so Brinkley showed up, and they wouldn't let him in. <clears throat> and I honestly don't know that they let anyone in. <laughs> you know, it's like nobody was actually watching. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so he's like, you know what? I'm going to hold my own demonstration. So he finds another hospital, and there's no name. So this is probably edited by some famous Chicago hospital. It's like, we don't want to be associated with this guy. Yeah, sure. Like, let's take that out of the history. So I, I thought when I initially read up on him that he had only done this to 34 patients, but it turns out he did this to 34 patients during that demonstration. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> That's just the one He's demonstration? What? Yeah. So oh. 68 nuts. <laughs> How many? I don't. I don't know if you. Wait, did. do you have to do both of them? No, at a time? I think you just do one at a time. Okay, that's fair. You probably just walked around with a bucket of goat nuts. That... Yeah, like I don't know how fresh they have to be. Do you have to cut them out of the goat right away? And just think about all the possible reactions. Like you're gonna get some. No. You know, you could. These people could have had serum sickness. I think a lot of them died within. Or a lot of the people that did die died relatively quickly after the procedure. When I was going to say, like, a little bit of a callback to previous episode, when they were doing a lot of this experimentation and transplant kind of medicine, even when, especially the early stages of uh, doing transfusions between animals and people, you know, a lot of the initial setups that they did, people didn't die because the apparatus they made didn't work. It would clot off, but they didn't know it. And that actually saved people. Because if you take a foreign substance, being a goat ball in this case, and you put it into a person, the person's immune system goes, no. No, absolutely not, and attacks it, and you're going to have, at best, at best, that gland will sit in there and become calcified as your body basically walls it off from everything, or at worst, all the antibodies that are mad about the goat ball being wherever they attached it, they're going to start attacking things and releasing all these chemical substances, and you're going to get sick, and I mean, I can imagine you could die, and this is, you know, it's also an era before, this is technically before antibiotics too, right? Yeah. At least 20, yeah. it's kind of on that cusp. Yeah. Uh, it's on one the week. Cusp. I don't know that they did uh, routine surgical prophylaxis with antibiotics, but no. uh, there's right. a lot of holes in this guy's theory is what yeah. I'm saying. And, and the weird part about it, too, is that you know, it's foreign material. So we've seen that. Like you get a sliver, it your body creates this inflammatory immune response. The sliver is ultimately pushed out. I think what happened with these goat nuts is that like your body either broke it down, reabsorbed them, or potentially like... They abscessed and got squished out by a pocket of pus. Mm. <laughs> Either way, did you have more vigor and uh, sexual prowess after yeah, that happened? No, so what happened is that <laughs> one of the first guys, I think it was the farmer, so the first guy, I mean, he just struck luck, right? So the first guy is impotent, uh, he hasn't been able to have a baby, they want to start a family, they can't. He puts a goat testicle in the guy, and then the wife gets pregnant. Then that was hmm. like case zero. Like this all is all he needed. It's all he needed. And that's, but who knows? It probably wasn't even him. Who's the dad? Yeah. They can't do genetic <laughs> testing, you know. Like maybe it was Brinkley. He's like, I it got it. Was the farmer's was name? Was the Brinkley. farmer's wife named Sally? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be that's, concerning because he probably would go Brinkley. for it. Yeah, Sally or Sarah. <laughs> so yeah, this on this demonstration, he he treats thirty four patients, um, and they're high profile individuals. And I think he needed that, right? So the dean of the Chicago Law School. Gets a goat nut. And a local alderman, goat nut. A local judge. He's a guy with a profession you don't want to mess up on. Yeah. Right? Wow. The dean of the law. That's, that's ballsy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so his practice like gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And then he ultimately finds his way to Hollywood because, I mean, these are the people that, you know, they have enough money to be dangerous <laughs> and they are stupid enough to let people do this stuff to them. Oh, my God. You know, I'm sure nothing that, changes. That, fortunately, that changed. Yeah, we don't do that anymore. <laughs> yeah, right. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> yeah, now yeah, now stars like they go to school, they listen to the to stars are in on it. Now they are marketing the same things to people. I mean, it's actually it's gone a whole new level of crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so at the height of his success, he was making in today's dollars twelve million dollars a year doing oh these God. procedures. That's uh that's not a bad living. So what you're yeah. saying is that we should quit our jobs and the podcast and just start sewing goat nuts into people. Doing that or any other number of like bizarre unproven I feel like medical we need to things. Do, oh, we should sell merch. Goat balls merch. Like mm-hmm. not real ones. Don't worry, we wouldn't do that. But Dr. Goat Balls <gasps> that's always figures. The most demoralizing part of these stories is how much damn money these people make. I know. It, well, but also demoralizing just wait or inspiring. Turnabout's fair play. <laughs> just wait. <laughs> Um, so he wasn't just a bad doctor, but he was also a very shrewd opportunist. <laughs> so, uh, for some reason, okay. So the guy, you know, he's doing his medical practice. He's transplanting goat nuts into human nuts. Then he realized, cause this is kind of early on in radio, like radios can be a great marketing medium. He can reach way more people. You put a, an ad in the newspaper, it, you, it's going to be okay, but your return on your money is really radio. So buying airtime for stuff like this probably was going to be a challenge. Like you had to pass, I think there's a federal radio commission. Like you couldn't hawk your goods like, like right. this. Um, so he bought his own radio station. So he called it Kansas first, Kansas best. And I think it was like 5,000 Watts at the time. I think it was the biggest radio or the most powerful radio station in the country. They might have, yeah, because I mean, I remember there was a big radio station when I was growing up, and my family we listened to a lot of radio. Probably why I'm so into podcasts. But I remember that was the the biggest one in the West, and their like catchphrase was the fifty thousand watt blowtorch of the West. You know, <laughs> so this is that's ten times what was then. This guy's radio output power, you know, and that that's modern day. So that's that's mm-hmm. that's just crazy scale. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he was really like he was spreading this far and wide, and again, like. American Medical Association and other concerned parties got involved because they were hearing these radio ads. And I think he would play it nonstop. So he would record <laughs> a, a thing to, to air. He wouldn't do it live. And it would just be, go, go. You know, here's Dr. Brinkley talking about goat nuts. So he had you his could, own 24-hour yeah. infomercial broadcasting Essentially, network. Yeah. So in the 1920s then, so as he's doing this and people are hearing more about it, they started investigating him as a person a little bit more. And then they held this grand jury just because the diploma mills were really concerning. And and he was kind of like the big example of that. Like these people should not be, you know, have this platform because they're not, they're not trained. Mm-hmm. He's a charlatan. So mm-hmm. um, they, uh, they put out this, this policy statement admonishing diploma mills and the people that received them. And they wanted to bring him in for questioning. So these officers from California came to arrest Brinkley to bring him out uh, to California to sit in front of this grand jury and just kind of figure out what the heck, how we got to that point. Uh, do you know what, like roughly when this is? Uh, I think it's, I think it's 1920. Okay. Wait. Yeah. Uh, I might've gotten my dates wrong. I apologize. Okay. To I, I was just kind of curious. It's just how I, uh, look, uh, yeah, it's just kind of how I keep track of things. No big deal. Mm-hmm. The issue was like Brinkley was so interconnected in Kansas. He was good friends with the governor. So they wouldn't allow him to get extradited for this questioning. And Brinkley <laughs> didn't want to go. Nice. Cause he knew he was done. Nice. So, and he made the state a lot of money, like doing this stuff. And I don't know exactly how, maybe it had to do with the radio station. Maybe it had to do with the clinic or property taxes, or maybe it was just like under Mm. the table money. So then this guy got ticked. And again, he's, he feels like he's more important than he actually is. So he started a a feud with the president of the American Medical Association, Dr. Fishbean. (laughs) And then down the road, ultimately- yeah. That's his name. Oh, wow, Which it is his be, name. Yeah, and ultimately I'm sued him for libel for speaking out against his treatments. Excellent. Got a counter sue. Oh, but this Vigorously. book, like his book is awesome. Like Fish Bean, I read, you know, you can still get excerpts this online. Being, I'm sorry, this being the guy who brought him Fish to Beans, trial. Yeah, it's essentially yeah. like he's calling out every quack that existed at the time and telling him like what he's, what these people are telling the public and what they're actually doing and how dangerous it was. You could get it on Amazon. It was like 90 bucks. So I was like, I'm not going yeah, yeah, <laughs> to. That's okay. But, that's all right. <laughs> but anyway, it exists still. You could still buy it. A very interesting read. And the guy, like, wow, you could tell that he was a smart guy. I mean, he was the president of the AMA. He was, like, protecting the profession, really. Hmm? So, again, Brinkley's on the radio. He's promoting his goat gland treatments all day. And he kept saying goat gland. So looking for credibility, he travels to Europe. 
so he he's got this eclectic medical degree that nobody's really honoring anymore. Mm-hmm. So then he thinks if he gets an honorary degree from a well-known institution, then he's going to have more credibility. It worked so, for Elon Musk. Yeah, so he goes right. around Fair. all the countries in Europe and ultimately uh, winds up at the University of Pavia or University in Pavia, Italy. So he gets his honorary degree. He's awesome. So but, wait, hold on. I'm sorry, Dr. Provolone went there. Yeah, hey, hey, <laughs> Dr. Provolone. There's there's not enough of goat balls in your sack, and you need a one more. <laughs> But oh, he, uh, yeah, so fish being like he catches wind that the guy got an honorary degree. So he pressured the Italian government to rescind it. And you know who rescinded it? Hmm. Benito Mussolini. Oh, <laughs> yeah. nice. So he actually did a good re- thing, I guess. Yeah, right. Oh, Not the only one thing. Oh, anyway. That and trains, um, really, all downhill otherwise. Yeah, so he, he ends up, like, you know, fish beans, got the pressure on him. He's really trying to break this guy down. And then, like, the community starts to turn on him, and that's when he really starts to lose. Like, the medical mm. community turned on him, and then the community at large. The Kansas Medical Society had a, a formal hearing to decide whether Brinkley's medical license should be revoked. Uh, apparently, there's, like, they caught him up on some technicalities. It wasn't necessarily, like, you're causing harm to people by doing something that doesn't make any sense. But he signed death certificates for 42 people. A lot of these people weren't sick when they showed up at the clinic, but ultimately died. So there, mm. you know, there's at least 42 people that we know about that died from the procedure. I'm sure he kept great records and all those right. messes. Yeah, because initially I was like, oh, he only did this on 35 people and 42 people died. Well, <laughs> his mortality rate's <laughs> plus 1,000. <laughs> Got that mortality interest. A little bit of a problem. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so... His surgery cost seven hundred fifty dollars per operation, which is eighty seven hundred bucks in today's dollars, which I think is a lot for unproven medical <laughs> thing. So then, mm-hmm. like the story kind of continues on. It's just kind of your normal sad, like famous, questionable doctor that we've covered before, like this trope. So six months after losing his medical license, the federal radio commission refused to renew his station's broadcasting license, and I think it's essentially the the government was like, "We're done with you." Yeah. Um, he tried to run for governor and, but like, <laughs> no, okay. but classic, hey. classic Brinkley, right? So like he misses the deadline. It was like a last minute, like, oh, I'll run for governor. He almost won on a write-in ballot. He god. almost won. Oh my god. Uh, yeah. So he added, he got added late and almost won, oh, <laughs> which is crazy. Yeah. He was still a hugely popular figure in Kansas, but still had some some pretty powerful enemies still wanted to do radio. So he moved his radio station to the Mexican border. And then his second radio station was the most powerful radio station on the globe. And apparently hmm. it was 1 million Watts. <laughs> what? So like, they said like in Texas, one you could hear watts. his radio station in your dental work in fences. Uh, <laughs> the, like, <laughs> that's, yeah, you can hear it in insane. Canada. <laughs> God. Yeah. And I don't know what he was playing at that point. I don't know. Oh, he, I'm sure the same he? thing. Still yeah, doing. Well, I mean, how much, how much, how was he drawing that much power back then? I mean, I how do you? But he, you said the the station itself was in Mexico, though. It was so, yeah, oh, I, I think it was on the Mexican side of the the border. Yeah. So right over the border. Okay. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's just that's kind of an a, sort of an impressive engineering feat. Like well, I, 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 I didn't do too. a lot of reading before this. Just I kind of wanted to see where this one went. But the, the very cursory, just kind of glancing over the like an article or two I found about him, a lot of it is like, yep really not a should not be considered a physician in any respect Mm -hmm. his radio stuff's kind of impressive though and i was wondering about that so here you're getting to it you know yeah he's really an innovator and that's that's the thing about people like this a lot of times you know like for all of his faults and like he wasn't didn't seem like he was a good person he was an innovator in some way shape or form you know probably helped the development of radio and things like that who knows what else he could have helped with just by you know running these radio stations Mm-hmm. Definitely didn't do anything for medicine other than sh- <laughs> like, no, well, maybe, maybe argued that, you know, uh, an accredited <laughs> well, medical education is really important. Yeah. I was going to say that. Yeah. That, well, he and a lot of people around it, as we pointed out earlier, that, that they did bring this spotlight on medical education in the U S mm-hmm. and I think that is not his intended, but it is a net positive yeah. in the end. Yeah. So yeah. And 38, so fish being, it's kind of like the catch me if you can thing that, Movie so Fish Bean is Tom Hanks's character, and Brinkley is uh, Leonardo. I don't know if you know that movie, DiCaprio. Wait, movie? It's Catch Me If You Can. So the guy like is oh, pretending yeah, yeah, yeah. to be oh, all sure, these sure, things. Sure. It's good movie. Yeah. So this Fish Bean is on his 
case for nearly two decades, trying to shut him and all the people like him down. But but the book I was talking about this it was this two part series called Modern Medical Charlatans, and really Brink it was essentially Brinkley. It was like uh, the guide on how to take down Dr. Goat Balls. Um, Brinkley <laughs> that did was a, that was Fishbean's nemesis. Yeah, no, it was like they were mortal enemies. So Brinkley finally had enough, and I think he thought, I'm going to win a case. So he sued Fishbean for libel and $5 million in damages, which is like an insane amount of money back then. I'd have <laughs> oh, to do absolutely. the, I mean, if 750 is 8,700, I mean, we're talking. Yeah, it's, it's a lot. Yeah, yeah. Well, he could money. continue his lavish lifestyle, you know. Right. So, um, of course, Brinkley lost his libel case. <laughs> then, then this is what opened up all the lawsuits against Brinkley, all the wrongful death suits, all that, because now it became a national thing. There's mm-hmm. all these people like I was at Brinkley's clinic in Kansas back in 1925, and I got a goat testicle, and you know now my nuts, <laughs> like I had to have them surgically removed, <laughs> you know, like whatever. So he gets a barrage of of, uh, of big complaints and lawsuits, mm-hmm. um, and then he was investigated by the IRS for tax fraud. So just three years later, declares bankruptcy in 1941 Hmm. and then died on May 26, 1942, penniless of heart failure at the age of 56. Hmm. So that's why I'm saying like the turnabout's fair play. He, yeah, I mean, he he lived fast, he died fast. He ascended and he crashed. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, there are people who who didn't. They got away with a lot of stuff. Right. I guess in some ways a little bit enheartening to hear that uh, sometimes the system did kind of get it right. Yeah, the system really got it. It The damage was done. Mm -hmm. Damage was done. Yeah, so he's um, he was buried in Forest Hill Cemetery in Memphis, Tennessee. I mean, just the interesting thing. I guess maybe not interesting. It was on the Wikipedia article. I didn't see Mm -hmm. this anywhere else. But anyway, his grave was defaced. There was a, a winged angel marking the grave on this big pillar. Somebody cut it off and took it. I don't know how interesting that is, but anyway. I wonder where that is. His house <laughs> is still standing. It's called the Brinkley Mansion. Uh, this is down in Texas. Hmm. And then the interesting part was that apparently, and I don't know if this is current, this might have been on the back burner, but there's a movie in the works about Brinkley's life starring Robert Downey Jr. <laughs> Potentially. I, he, he, could, he could pull it off. I wonder I, if he was bald. No, he wasn't bald, okay. Brinkley, because Robert well, Downey be Jr. Movie. shaved his head. But yeah. he could put on a wig. Yeah, That's I true. don't know. It, Interesting. What a crazy stuff. It's amazing how long and he was successful. I mean, you would think, you'd hope things like this wouldn't happen, but they do it all the time just, and like, still do. So The thing is, if this was like 1492 or 1523 right. or 17 whatever, you'd be like, okay, I can understand how people could buy this. But this is like, again, germ theory is a thing. There are you know operating room theaters. There's anesthesia. Medicine is becoming modernized. And people were okay with transplanting this. goat nuts into you. Like, it doesn't make any sense. You know, you mentioned that he he would go to a town, and I think part of that media, he, not only mail, but like media blitz, he would make sure it seems like newspapers knew he was coming if he was moving yeah. to a new town. Mm-hmm. And so people would see stuff written in, in the paper that seemed to lend this credibility. That it becomes time truth, when... yeah. Right, right. And so... Um, Hello, gentlemen. Pardon the interruption. I found some newspaper clippings from Dr. Brinkley if you'd like to review them. Oh, good timing. Let's check them out. Would you care for some old-timey music to accompany this experience? Yes, please. So, first one is from February 3rd, 1920, the Fort Worth Star-Telegram. Kansas surgeon uses goat glands to cure sterility by International News Service, Milford, Kansas, February 3rd. All Kansas today was watching the outcome of the latest remarkable experiment of Dr. J. R. Brinkley, chief surgeon of the Brinkley Jones Hospital, in grafting the interstitial glands of a goat into human beings to, to cure those treated of sterility. Within the past two years, by means of such operations, Dr. Brinkley has made it possible for three men and one woman to become parents. In all four cases, the glands of a male goat were used. In each instance, a baby boy was born. In his most recent case, Dr. Brinkley used the gland of a female goat. I do not say this woman will have a girl baby, said Dr. Brinkley today, but I am experimenting. It may be merely a coincidence that all the babies so far have been boys. Imagine seeing that in your newspaper. Yeah. Right? That might be your only source of any, like, what's going on in the world. Yeah. 
The following is from the San Diego Union and Daily Bee, February 6, 1920. It's Dr. Brinkley speaking here. In deciding upon these experiments, therefore I selected the goat as a gland producer rather than the monkey or the human being. A San Francisco surgeon has used the glands of condemned criminals, but there are dangers of hereditary influences to be considered there. The criminal's glands may be diseased, and these diseases might be manifested in a future generation. My own experiments have shown conclusively that the glands can be transplanted and that they function properly after transplanting. We have the babies here to prove it, and these babies don't look like goats either. That's an interesting fact I wish you'd be sure to add. As any number of persons have asked me, would there be any danger of children looking like members of the goat family? The goat gland becomes a part of the human system and functions naturally after it's transplanted. It's silly for anyone to believe that distinct animal traits would be revealed in children that owe their being to the goat gland. I mean, come on, people. <laughs> the mere fact and that they're asking if you're going to turn into a goat is like, come on. What the hell? <laughs> that uh, was my first red flag. I don't know about you but guys. Then, yeah, did he, con- did he did he connect the vast deference to the other guys? Like, there's you no know, chance no way. No. That no. means no that chance. <laughs> no, there's no way. I wonder. Like, you know, you know what happened? He took the testicle, he ran a stitch through it, and he just stitched it to something. He must was have. like, yep. I did an operation. Yeah, yeah, I'm he sure because he, he wouldn't let anyone it. see it. I wonder yeah, how many actual goat glands. I he wanted actually, to see. Yeah, like here's we the, just injected a little bit. Or in, oh no, here's the diagram. He get, but he had to keep it secret. Well, I mean, because it didn't make which, any which, freaking if sense. If you're a surgeon, what you want to do when you have the best surgery is you want to make sure nobody can replicate it. <laughs> yeah, but he yeah. he specifically said like people could try to replicate this, but your patients are probably going to die because only I know how to do it. Maybe he didn't even put them in. You know, I'm maybe very he glad put in modern. Well, no, that's true. I mean, I'm, I'm glad be, that our yeah. modern surgeons, uh, you know, don't like keep that knowledge of how to take out an appendix to themselves. Yeah, right. I mean, so best case scenario was a sham surgery, right? Like you just cut yeah. and sewed something back together. Well, that would have been. Yeah, a... maybe you get a little hematoma. It feels like there's a nut in there, but it's really just blood, and then it resorbs over time. Because I honestly don't know how a goat testicle implanted in your scrotum would ever dissolve without becoming an abscess. I, no, I don't yeah. think it would. Yeah. Yeah. No. So honestly, but you'd have to put something in there for people because they. I'm sure they would. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I don't know. Maybe it was. A, I don't know. A I don't pledget, know. A pledget soaked with male sexual hormones. <laughs> <laughs> they probably had an isolated one of those testosterone. Hormones? Will my baby look like a goat? Yeah, they would just drip a cotton ball and bang energy drink, then shove that in your nuts. <laughs> there you go. You go to town. <laughs> Well, I think on that note, that is probably about all we have time for today. We appreciate everyone listening, and we'd love to hear from all of you out there. If you'd like to send us a message or provide feedback, we can be reached through our website, www.poorhistorianspod.com, and there you will find links to our social media sites. We do take emails at poorhistorianspod at gmail.com, and we do work to respond to all posts on our various social media accounts. And hey, this episode is proof that we actually do listen to those emails, and we do use your suggestions. So thanks again, Lori. If you have time, please go and leave us a nice five-star review on iTunes or on whichever platform you choose. All of those do help raise the show's profile and searches and those sort of things. But hey, better yet, tell a friend about us. Maybe let's say you work in an office with cubicles, right? Find someone you might work with who's sitting quietly. It doesn't matter if you know them very well. Go into their cubicle and kind of stand in the doorway and then start telling them about this podcast because it's really hard to escape out the back of a cubicle. There is no escape. Right? So once you have them cornered, let them know how much you enjoy the show, and we'll look forward to having them as a future listener. And if you'd like to support the show in other ways, check out Poor Historian's merchandise through our website, including t-shirts, mugs, all that sort of thing. But it's too late to get them for Christmas because this is after Christmas, so oh well. But that being said, if you're old-fashioned, send us a postcard from a strange vacation spot. Because does anybody do that anymore? I haven't had a postcard in years. Hmm. Um... Until- I think Still you buy getting them. Christmas cards. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think you can. Yeah. It, are Christmas cards just like um, hard copy Instagram post? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes, that's what they are. <laughs> Until next time, poor historians are so Oh, wait, 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 wait. No, uh, the it. last piece of the thing I'd mm-hmm. like to direct the listeners um, to oh. a documentary called Nuts with an exclamation point. The, that's a real thing? Yeah. The, the picture, uh, like the, the art for the movie is fantastic it's okay brinkley with a nice hat on he's wearing a white suit he's riding on a goat that is about the size of a horse who has gigantic nuts mm. and there are two big radio waves and it looks like the plains in texas but anyway okay. uh 2016 
a director by Give the name. Give me a link. Penny I'll, Lane. I'll put it in the notes. I will. Uh, actually, I so I tried to find it. I couldn't watch it. But he's that also been too disturbing. Really oh, the picture! Watch. I could get the picture. Yeah, <laughs> no, <laughs> just I wanted to watch it. I just couldn't find a like. Yeah, it apparently, was it Sundance? Oh, Sundance in 2016. We have to review it. Yeah, I'll work on it. Belching sounds is it sounds gross in this medium. I don't recommend <laughs> it. Keep, you don't want to do ASMR in. belching? <laughs> yeah. Somebody out there would pay for it. I was just thinking when they did the, the uh, blindfolds ASMR. in the old operating theater, that's essentially, mm-hmm. it's like bone cutting ASMR. Yeah. Because you can't see. Oh. It's just like. Except for the <laughs> physical yeah, pain that's associated with yeah. it. Yeah. Wow. That is a weird. Dar- they're, I'm not they're probably, wrong. There's probably an audience for it, to be honest with you. <laughs> mm. uh, Aaron, you want to be professor? You sound professory. Yeah, I can do it. Maybe a little, a little, just a little British. Well, I'd British. like to this think a, there's an open door policy here. I know, but yeah, Chicago. Okay, it's in Chicago though. <laughs> yeah, Chicago. Chicago well, I like the name. <laughs> I'm from Chicago. Listen to me, Dobbers. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, yeah, like I'll just do head accent and see how that works. <laughs> it should be pretty easy for me, apparently. Yeah, Hello, my name's Aaron. I'm from Chicago. I don't know how to drive. <laughs> I, I either go 90 miles an hour or 40 miles an hour on the freeway. I like to go 40 in the left lane, 90 in the right. <laughs> That'll definitely be in the outtake. <laughs> yeah, Skip well, that's, uh, Wait, but we have, like, I think our second biggest listenership metro area is Chicago. Whoa. So we might not want to uh, alienate them. Oh, they know. Are you it's, saying that people from know. Chicago are fragile? I used to be one of them, you know. <laughs> no, I'm just saying, like, like you don't. Uh, it's you impossible don't... to alienate Chicago because Chicago's already alienated you. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what the sign says the as, as you shape. enter Wisconsin? <laughs> Chicago, yeah, Chicago's Don't be like sad. That. Chicago's already alienated you. <laughs> Did uh, I capture the historic moment well, though? Oh, oh yeah, I mean yeah, it was right on. Like I said, there'll be another moment. The like where it starts his idea, and that's pretty I'm, good too. I'm, I'm excellent. Again, right. this is going to be very informal. Very informal. It's going to be a roundtable discussion well, with three people we, that we're, we know. need to have our Doctor Goat Balls episode be be on the level. Formal. On, like. <laughs> Welcome segment. 